Excellent. Um, welcome to the almost last panel of the day, Technology and Foreign Interference, The View from Europe. Um, we have a fabulous set of experts, uh, diplomats, um, and we have a lot to learn. So I'm going to uh, introduce them in the order from which we're going to hear from them. Um, we're going to start first in Estonia. Uh, and there's a reason why we're starting in Estonia, other than its own fabulousness. Uh, it has to do with what happened in that country in April 2007. Um, we are joined by His Excellency Jonathan Sivjov to talk about uh, what happened in Estonia and how Estonia has become E-Estonia. We're then going to go to Her Excellency Karen Olofstadter to talk about how Sweden has responded to the challenges it confronts uh, from both Russian efforts to, it's hard to believe, shape a negative reputation of Sweden, um, and how Sweden has used non-tech approaches. Uh, our conversation today has gone back and forth between tech responses to foreign interference in democratic and other institutions and the non-tech uh, solutions. And probably this panel might err a little bit on the non-tech side. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Jean-Baptiste uh, Jeannier Villemer to talk about the lessons from France and specifically the 2017 election of President Macron and the efforts by the Russian government to try and affect that election, but how French citizens were held strong and what that lesson has for us to learn, particularly here in the United States. Uh, and finally, for the big picture and to bring us back to the issues of tech and policy or tech versus policy, we're joined by Dr. Alina Palyakova to talk about the lag between development in technology and responses in policy. Um, some of my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon have been, let's say, I would say maybe surprised or just observing that these tech policy dialogues haven't happened more often and that the, there, there's a delay in, um, and I'm talking about Ed Hovey as he walks in the room, the delay between tech development and policy development, and that policy takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of talking, particularly if there are issues that uh, policymakers don't understand well. And we are in an era of confronting a lack of public policy technologists. So that is a, one of the gaps that we definitely want to fill. So we're going to have a quick round through the panelists before opening it up for discussion. Um, I'll be somewhat ruthless, uh, although hopefully not undiplomatic, in moving us along so that we can be short of having that conversation. We have just about a little bit over an hour to, to have this conversation. So let's start in Estonia. And let's start, Jonathan, with the issue of your country had one of the first uh, cyber attacks, maybe the first major cyber attack where the internet was brought down. Um, you were already as a government well on your way to understanding and wrapping yourselves around the internet, um, but you've made considerable um, advances and anybody who is lucky enough to be um, a guest in Estonia will recognize the kind of uh, advances that you've had. What do you what do you reckon, as we'd say? What do you reckon the world would look like if we had taken what happened to Estonia in two thousand seven, not just more seriously, but really paid attention to it? Uh, and how have you how did, has it evolved in your own thinking in Estonia as a result of what the Russians did? Thanks. Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here. I understand this is we're approaching the end of the day. Uh, you're the last survivors, so congratulations. <laughs> Um, and I only have a few minutes, so I can't go into detail. Uh, so I'll just mention the, 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 the big themes uh, that we learned in 2007 before and after. Um, so indeed, in 2007, we had uh, the, the, the first wave of, of cyber attacks that the modern world um, knows of. And they're significant for a number of reasons. Uh, first, obviously, being that we are a very internet-dependent society already back then. Estonia had built up what we consider to be the first digital nation in the world. Uh, just to give you a few ideas, I mean, we, we literally, almost all of the interaction between the citizen and the government takes place online. We're very proud of the fact. 
We even vote online. We do our taxis online in usually less than two or three minutes. Um, we sign documents in a legally binding way with a digital signature. So most often when the president signs bills into law, she does not use a pen and a pa paper. She uses the digital ID. So obviously very proud of our digital uh, backbone. And that obviously means that cyber security is of paramount importance. And, and in 2007, um, what we uh, experienced were not very sophisticated attacks against government networks. These have happened before in other parts of the world are happening every day today. And that's not necessarily newsworthy, uh, that your military or intelligence or law enforcement officers or their servers come under attack. What happened to us in 2007 was that the target was not the government. The target was the society. Uh, it was bringing down you know, newspaper websites, um, you know, individuals, emails, the stuff that people actually use. And the fact that the military or the intelligence services databases were functioning perfectly mattered little because people could not access their online banking, they couldn't access news and so on and so forth. So we recognize that this is indeed a whole of society problem. Now there are a number of, of uh, false conceptions around what happened in 2007. One is that this was a cyber event. It was not. It was part of a wider um, effort to destabilize the Estonian society and um, uh, strive towards uh, um, at, you know, uh, breaking Estonia from its allies in the West, uh, creating disunity in the Western alliance. So it was uh, obviously the cyber dimension that matters, but also the, a very aggressive propaganda effort, both vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Estonian population, but also, equally importantly, the wider world. There was a foreign policy aspect to it. There were other aspects to it. So it's always a part of the bigger picture. Secondly, uh, Obviously, the 2007 uh, events uh, heightened the uh, level of attention we and our colleagues and allies in NATO and the European Union, um, uh, the, the level of attention we paid to cyber uh, issues. It would be, however, false to assume that a cyber attack is just something that concerns the computers and the servers and the, you know, the bits and bytes and the ones and zeros. When cyber is utilized by a government, as was the case in 2007. This is not just a natural phenomena that is taking place, not just a, an accident of some sorts. This is, uh, there is always a human being behind the attack with his or her own cost-benefit analysis and decision-making process. So if you want to deal effectively with cyber challenges, then you need to address not the computer part, even though that's important as well, and there are technicians working on that but obviously also the political part, the human being that's behind the attack. And you need to affect the cost-benefit analysis of that person or group of people who have uh, decided to, um, to uh, test your society's resilience. Now, we have become better um, at all of this in the years since. In 2007, um, uh, we were successful in convincing friends and allies that, that the digital domain matters. But we uh, were not successful in convincing our Western uh, friends of the fact that this is now a pattern. Mm -hmm. This is something that uh, it was not an isolated incident uh, regarding a statue in Estonia. This is part of Russia's foreign policy, Russia becoming more assertive, more active on the international stage. So fast forward one year, 2008, Georgia, um, part of the same storyline, but we weren't successful after that either. Um, after a few weeks of dominating the news cycle, the Russian narrative started to gain uh, traction. Uh, and the narrative that the Russians were uh, pushing was not one of an alternative explanation to what had happened. The aim was not to convince us of their version of the facts. The goal was to confuse us into paralysis, something that we see with the use of propaganda, not only in the recent past, but also starting from, you know, from, from decades ago. So 2008 uh, brought the, um, uh, the importance of the military aspect to the uh, discussion. And then obviously fast forward to Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, uh, elections interference. And now I think we in the West uh, are in consensus when it comes to what the threat is, uh, that this is not a, a, um, a misunderstanding of sorts or a set of isolated events. When you look at the NATO uh, leaders meeting uh, past, uh, last week and the declaration that they issued and the wording on Russia, this is actually the strongest wording that NATO in an official document uh, 
which is consensus uh, based obviously has used on uh, when describing uh, how we assess Russia it's not a challenge not an issue it is a threat a threat to euro atlantic security so we've come a long way when it comes to that i i don't know what would have been had we been faster whether we had been maybe um, able to avoid some of the um, further escalatory steps what i do however want to conclude with is this notion that i think is is critical in politics and military affairs obviously also in foreign policy and there's this notion of um, of, of a necessity for uh, proactiveness. We've been pretty good at reacting, uh, even though you could probably find areas where we've been not as fast as we would have liked to, uh, but we're certainly on the right path. But as is known and has been known for centuries, uh, a precondition for success is initiative. And one of the things I would consider when dealing with foreign interference, um, assuming again that there is a human being behind the interference, that it's not a machine that just decided to somehow interfere with our democracies. The question is, how do you, how do you move from being reactive to possibly also presenting some kind of a proactive uh, policy line? And if we do not intend to do that consciously, then we need to spend a lot of time and a lot of effort thinking through our sort of you know, theory for success or strategy for success by reacting only. It's probably doable, uh, but it would require a lot more uh, strategizing than what we've been able to do. So if interested in how it all got started, I would certainly look at the 2007 and Estonian experience, but I would also go back uh, in history, uh, leaving aside new technologies, looking at the methods from you know 1979, there's not much that's strikingly new uh, in this in this game here. Thank you so much for setting the context of uh, what we call the new Russian foreign policy, which is really the old uh, parts of the old Soviet foreign policy. Um, but let's turn to Sweden. Um, th this is hard because a lot of citizens either they're too young, they don't remember what the Soviet Union was like, they don't know anything about Russian foreign policy. Sweden has been blessed to not experience war for 200 years. 200 years. Um, and yet you are also on the front line. Um, and there's good research that's been done that has suggested uh, the Kremlin had Sweden in its sights as you went into the 2017, uh, 2018 elections. So Karen, why don't you tell us about how Sweden has responded? Thanks a lot, and thank you really for, for inviting me, and uh, I, of course, agree with uh, everything that Jonathan said. Well, we look at this from, I want to stress two things today. Uh, first is um, that the influence operations that we see on our country and globally, I think, uh, the targets as all, well, uh, we must see that in a wider concept uh, and a wider context. It's an ongoing kind of way of Russia to to uh, show its dominance in Europe, create instability, and so on. So we must look at the why is Russia acting the way it is. I mean, Russia for us is the biggest uh, biggest threat in this. There are other countries that could be, uh, or other actors that, that can also be uh, seen on the scene, but just for today's discussion, and also what we are mostly focusing in my country. Uh, and that is, of course, to destabilize the European security order. So that's uh, the why in our, in our, in our uh, analysis. And then um, when it comes to the second highlight I would like to do is this uh, um, what you, proactive stance that you talked about, Jonathan. We are really taking that very seriously and we are going back to our old concept of total defense that we had during the Cold War. Uh, so we are kind of revamping or dusting off uh, the way we were uh, operating uh, during, during the Cold War. So uh, first issue then, uh, as I said, looking at the why, uh, and as we are where we are, and Estonia is where it is as well, uh, we look at um, how the Russia tries to interfere in our domestic uh, affairs uh, and in our policy development. And we think that this is really part of, as I said, a bigger scheme for Russia to, to destabilize the European security order. And we must see it in the context of the attack on Estonia, then the cyber attack, uh, 
uh, Russia's withdrawal from the CFE treaty, the breaches of the INF treaty, Ukraine 2014, uh, illegal annexation of Crimea, what's going on in eastern Ukraine, uh, and and all these all these issues. So this this is just another way of, of operating and part of the whole toolbox that we see from from Russia. So. Uh, Actually, I was just at the Reagan Forum, uh, National Defense Forum in Los Angeles, and they had done a um, survey. Uh, 23% of Americans think that Russia is an ally. That's quite severe. And it particularly strong among young people, I think. So this is something, I mean, th- we see how, how this interference has really worked in, in a way. I think it was actually of uniformed service people. Uh, it was even more striking. Yeah, it, it yeah maybe it was. I don't know that a detail. A large percentage yeah. of U.S. military service people completely misunderstanding yeah. where Russia was. Yeah, no, scary. Uh, and this, of course, even shows uh, shows even more how much we must work with this disinformation mm-hmm. and, and tackle it because it can really, as I said, destabilize our political um, situation uh, domestically as well. So then uh, to be uh, proactive and what do we do about this, uh, our approach is, as I said, to dust off and revamp and renew the total defense concept that we had during the Cold War, which we then, uh, when we thought the times were happier in the 90s, we scrapped <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, put in the dustbin. Uh, we are going back to a conscript army, we are enforcing our uh, defense, but as I said, also the total defense concept, which is really a whole of society concept, uh, where actually every Swede between the age of 16 in, and 70 can be called in for civil uh, duty, mm. for instance, in, kind of cri- in, in, in times of crisis. We look at how our, which business sectors are crucial for, uh, for the preservation of, of, of Sweden uh, in times of crisis. We are reintroducing or, again, um, installing an agency for psychological defense. And that main task will be, of course, uh, information operations, but also, uh, as uh, its task was during the Cold War, to keep the spirits up for defending uh, the country. We have sent out the brochure to all all Swedish households on uh, what you should think about in times of crisis, uh, also with a part of it related to information operations. Uh, You know, in the old days, this used to be part of the telephone book, uh, but as we don't have telephone books anymore, we have this new brochure. So we have experience in how we did all this. So we are just uh, looking at what we did in the in during those days and 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 going back to it. Also, just briefly, when it comes to uh, the elections we had that you uh, talked about, um, we prepared that in a very hands-on way. So we had the Swedish uh, Civil Contingency Agency, which Ella, my colleague here, is uh, representing together with the intelligence community, uh, the election authority, the police, uh, and county regional boards, they established operational formats where they shared information uh, between each other uh, when it came to comes to this kind of information operations. We educated over 10,000 public servants and over hundreds of uh, communicators in different sectors of, of the Swedish society that we thought were crucial uh, to this. So the awareness about information operations was huge uh, in Sweden at the time. Uh, we also uh, took up or pu- published a handbook on how to handle this. Uh, There's even a comics magazine for children about the world's kindest and strongest bear, uh, how how, uh, he, uh, you know, tackles this with information operations. So it's also going back to um, or teaching children early on how to value information. How do you judge information? And our prime minister um, made a public announcement that he would call out uh, any actor that tried to interfere in our elections. Mm. So uh, we did not see any um, major influence on our elections and uh, no consorted long term um, att- like attempt from from mostly the Russians to to interfere in our elections. Of course, it's hard to say exactly why that didn't happen. Maybe we're not interesting enough or they saw that we had prepared so well or they maybe realized that it could be counterproductive as well, because uh, one uh, our analysis is that um, one of the biggest worries for Russia is that Finland and Sweden would join NATO. And if it was known that Russia would interfere in our elections, maybe the 
the support for joining NATO would go up. Um, so there are many, many reasons for this. Setting election time uh, aside, we see uh, constant uh, kind of attacks or in trying to influence our country. And that is to you know, discredit the liberal, uh, social liberal way of life that we have in Sweden. 50% uh, of the articles on Sputnik coming, uh, relating to Sweden are about migration, mm. anti-migration. Uh, so there are a lot of aspects of Swedish society that are targeted as uh, too liberal or, uh, you know, Sweden is basically imploding as a country uh, and our values and so on from, from the Russian side. And this is a way, of course, to, to try to destabilize and, mm. and, and um, push for, for uh, another European security order. Yes, this issue of uh, the liberal... Uh, social order that's yeah. inside Sweden uh, as opposed to what it is that the Kremlin, the church in, in Russia are trying to advance. Um, let's turn to France, Jean-Baptiste. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, and thank you for having me uh, uh, today. Um, so as you know, uh, the, the wake-up call for us was the uh, so-called Macron leaks operation during the uh, 2017 presidential election where Macron was facing um, uh, Marine Le Pen, the, the far-right uh, candidate. And this operation was made of a disinformation campaign and a hack and leak operation. Uh, so I, I published a, an Atlantic Council report on that a couple of months ago in June. So if you want more details, then you can <laughs> read the report. But I will give you a few elements now. So the, the disinformation campaign came from both the Kremlin media, RT and, and Sputnik, and the American alt-right, uh, mostly on, on 4chan, Reddit, and Discord. Uh, it was about political attacks, uh, the usual populist narratives, uh, what you said on, on migration, we have the same uh, issue in, in, in France, obviously, uh, and personal attacks as well on Macron, the age difference with his wife, rumors about him being homosexual, etc. And that included, interestingly, the production of fake documents, among which PDFs supposedly proving that he had a, a, an offshore account uh, in, uh, in the Bahamas, which was false. So the hack and leak operation now uh, came a bit later. Uh, more than 21,000 emails uh, plus other documents were stolen from computers of five of Macron's associates. So it was not coming actually from uh, Macron's emails, but from five of his closest associates. What was found was not incriminating at all. So what they did is that they added fake messages, fake emails about uh, cocaine, homosexuality again, etc., uh, before leaking all of them. So that's why it falls into the category of what is called a tainted leak. It's a leak that was manipulated before being released. And it was released 48 hours before the second and final round of the election. And it was just hours uh, on a Friday night before the election silence period. And the goal was to mute uh, Macron's defense, Macron's team response, and the traditional media. So the hashtag Macron leaks was pushed by bots on Twitter. It reached half a million uh, tweets in only 24 hours. As far as attribution is concerned, there is still no official attribution, but it's normal because we don't do that in France. We don't uh, attribute. Uh, it was the case already in, uh, for the, the TV5 um, um, cyber attack in, in 2015. Um, but most observers and private security companies, they recognize an APT28 operation. And according to new evidence published by Le Monde newspaper a couple of days ago, so it's interesting that we discuss this now, uh, researchers uh, from Google and FireEye confirmed the involvement of not only APT28, but Sandworm, Sandworm sorry, um, uh, as well. So these two groups of hackers, as you know, are linked to the uh, GRU, the um, uh, Russian military intelligence. And therefore, it confirms the involvement of the Russian state. However, it's only half of the story, um, because another lead points to an American neo-Nazi named Andrew Arnheimer, and there are actually two categories of actors in the Macronics operation. You have uh, the Russian state on the one hand, but also the American alt-right. And the important thing in terms of attribution is to understand that they are not mutually exclusive. The question being to what extent did they work together or is it only some kind of convergence of interests? Mm -hmm. 
So we were lucky this time. We were lucky because we got attacked after the US. So in a way, we saw it coming. Uh, we, we could prepare. Um, uh, also because the attackers were sloppy and they made a number of mistakes. They did not anticipate Macron. Macron was also, in a way, too young to be dirty. He, th there was not a lot of stories uh, about him. <laughs> Nothing incriminating was found in the emails. The timing was bad. And there was also a cultural clumsiness. You don't use the gay card in France. It, mm. it, it may work in Russia or, or for America conservatives, but it does not work at all in France. Uh, no one cares about Macron being gay. And, and, and I don't think he is, <laughs> but it's not the point. Uh, also, they used English, mostly. Uh, the hashtag was Macron leaks. It was not fuite, uh, Macron fuite or something like this in French. They used English, which is not the best way to penetrate a French audience. That is, <laughs> that is <laughs> known not to be very good at foreign languages, right? <laughs> So, uh, and another explanation uh, of this uh, success, if you like, is that Le Pen was easy to beat. Macron consistently polled at 20, 25 points uh, above, higher uh, than her. So he would have won anyway, uh, with or without um, such an operation. However, the next time, uh, with a more sophisticated attack, with a more socially acceptable far-right candidate, there will be a smaller margin and such an operation could be decisive, and that's why we need to prepare. So what I'd like to do now is to uh, give you six um, lessons learned or what we need for democratic resilience, what we learned from this episode. So number one is uh, obviously, uh, but it's, yes, it's obvious, uh, global awareness. Uh, and when I say global awareness, I mean both within the state and among the population, because we think among the population, but there is a lot of education to be made within the state as well, and I see it. Uh, from my position, so I, I'm with the uh, French Ministry of Defense, and I know that from the internal administration uh, there is uh, uh, work to do. So media literacy, critical thinking, special training sessions for journalists, you mentioned what you do um, um, with the civil servants. Um, so for a previous report, which was called Information Manipulation, that we published in 2018, we toured uh, a lot of countries in, in Europe, and from my experience, the MSB, um, is is the best, and I'm not saying this That's because a agency. that yes, the MSB yes. is a Swedish ad agency, and I'm not saying that because I'm seated next to you, Madam Ambassador. But it's really what what they're doing is impressive in terms of global awareness, and we have a lot to learn from them. Uh, we need more research as well, which is funding for PhDs, funding mm. for postdocs, um, uh, and we need to work on the concepts. So the concept we work. We, we use in France is information manipulation. We don't like fake news. Uh, we don't really use disinformation. We like better information manipulation. I can explain that later if you'd like. Number two is to have and develop strong public and neutral institutions like Electoral Commission, Media Regulatory Authority, National Cyber Security Agency. Uh, this is what worked in the case of France and Canada learned from that because they created something similar to our Electoral Commission in their plan to fight election meddling that they presented last January. Number three is legislation. So we passed a law. Um, in November 2018, uh, but that is limited to electoral periods. I can also uh, give you more details on, on the law, but I don't think it's uh, satisfactory because we should not focus on elections only, and this is a mistake that most of the governments do. Number four is creating a dedicated structure within the state to deal with these threats. So the problem you have in the US is not that you don't have a dedicated structures in, in a way is that you have too many of them and you have an issue of coordination uh, between the GEC, between uh, Homeland, the Pentagon and, and others. In Europe, we have different issues. Um, so the MSB is a great model. Uh, Australia is interesting as well because they created recently a national coordinator for country interference. Uh, and another interesting discussion that we can have regarding maybe China, not Russia, is the gray area between interference and influence. So that's what we don't have in France at the moment. We improved coordination, but we don't have a dedicated structure. Uh, so we are a couple of uh, people uh, inside the administration trying to uh, convince others that we need to create this. Uh, but there are basically two obstacles. Uh, one is bureaucratic politics, uh, tough battles between ministries. To which ministry do you attach this new institution? Um, and another, another one is budget. Uh, 
So number five uh, is a productive and reactive civil society. And I think it's actually the most impo important part. Uh, this is what worked in the case of, of France, um, uh, in the case of the Macron leaks, uh, because anything the states will do with, with uh, will always be questioned. So the, the mistake uh, most people do is to believe that we are in uh, information warfare and therefore uh, that it's enough to correct the information to get the facts right. Um, but as long as we've got the facts and our adversaries got the good stories, we will lose. This is something Ben Nemo explained quite well when he was here with the Atlantic Council. Um, and he said very clearly, we're not in an information warfare, but in a narrative warfare. So I think this is the most important lesson that we need to learn. S that it means that we need to push stories as well. And this is why we need resources like DFL Lab. This is why we need resources like Bellingcat, because they detect, they analyze, and they write who don't need stories. And these who don't need stories become the story. So in the case of the Macron leaks, why it worked is because people lost interest in the content of the leaks, mm -hmm. because they were interested in who did that, who was behind the leak. So this is uh, uh, how we should shift the attention of the audience when we are attacked. So what we need is a DFR lab in French, and this is something that we, we, we are working on. Number six uh, is uh, international cooperation. Uh, it's necessary, of course. Uh, so you would tell me we have tools already. We have uh, the EU, and there are things happening at the EU and within the EU. NATO um, at Brussels and Riga as well. We have the G7. We have intelligence sharing. We have the bilateral relationships. But actually, none of this format is satisfactory. So what we need to create is some kind of an alliance of democracies to share good practices in terms of resilience. And I think we shouldn't stay in the comfort of the transatlantic community, which is another common mistake. Uh, because there is strong expertise in Asia Pacific. I think of Taiwan, Australia, but also Singapore, even though uh, technically they're not, uh, I would say, uh, as democratic as the others. Still, uh, they are very interesting in terms of expertise. And we should not forget about the Middle East, Israel. And finally, finally, I would highlight three main challenges. Um, the first, I think is not Russia, but the first challenge is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is our daily adversary. When we need to be flexible, when we need to be transversal, interministerial, innovative, reactive, fast, the inertia of our administrations is actually the best advantage of our adversaries. Two is technological democratization. So artificial intelligence, deepfakes, uh, and, and the others, you know about that. What is interesting is that they are not widely used now. But it's not because the technology is not ready. The technology actually is ready. Uh, it's because the attackers don't need it. They can use much basic forms of disinformation. It works. Why bother uh, with artificial intelligence and deepfakes? It does not mean that we should not prepare because it will come. And number three is uh, what I would call geopolitical diversification. So we need to think not only in terms of Russia and other states. Uh, China, we're working on China at the moment. Uh, our next report will be on China. Iran. <coughs> We have an interesting example uh, involving Iran in France uh, a couple of weeks ago, but also non-state actors, uh, alt-right, far-right populist movements. And we also need to think in terms of proxization, the use of proxies, in particular in Africa. And here I'd like to insist that we see at the moment, um, these last weeks, a lot of disinformation in the Sahel against the French military, against the Barkhane operation. And I believe it will increase in 2020 uh, because we'll start drone strikes. Uh, we are arming our drones at the moment. Um, and this is great material for disinformation, drone strikes. Um, so the question is to know to what extent this is endogenous, uh, because there is a strong post-colonial resentment anyway, or this is manipulated by a third party that could be Russia and China. Russia is very active on Mali at the moment. They're active physically. Uh, we know that the Wagner paramilitary is already there, for example, in Mali. But uh, also last uh, interesting information is that Sputnik is currently trying to be a partner for the Bamako Forum, which is like a, like a you know, decision-making uh, highest level forum in f that will happen next February. And Sputnik would like to partner with them and Mali could accept this uh, because Sputnik is f convincing and, and their media are already widely used in, in Western Africa. So this is, it does not look good. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste.
Uh, very interesting. We've got a lot of big policy questions we're going to circle back to, but we're going to go first to Alina. Um, so thank you so much for um, organizing this event uh, to both uh, institutions and to Ambassador Mendelssohn. Um, it's really just uh, wonderful to be on this panel with, um, first of all, Estonia and, and Sweden, the two countries I think have been at the forefront of understanding what to do about information manipulation, how to respond. Um, and even though Sweden has already been fully covered as uh, one of the countries to look to for lessons learned, I just want to reemphasize that again. Um, the Civil Contingencies Agency, known as the MSB, um, I think has developed what is the most comprehensive strategy I have seen um, in terms of responding to information manipulation, also building resilience to it as well. Um, but before I get to my main comments on, on the lag that we see in the tech policy space, I wanted to go back to the mention of the poll on military families because there's been a conversation online on Twitter happening between political scientists on the flawed nature of this poll. Um, and so I think um, just the way uh, uh, Jim Colby is the uh, political scientist who brought up some of these methodological issues, and I actually think it doesn't tell us as much as we think it does. Um, if you look at some of the problems with the survey, um, and Gallup has done a similar poll a few months ago, which just slightly different wording using friendly instead of ally, for example, that results in completely different outcomes. Um, so I'm not trying to... Um, you know, lower our uh, concern when it comes to info ops, but I think it's in this particular environment, given the sensitivity of this issue, it's important for us um, as researchers um, to be kind of aware of some of the limitations of this data that we're looking at instead of uh, jumping to conclusions, uh, which I think can be quite uh, tempting to do sometimes. Um, anyway, so I don't think it's as bad as it sounds based on that survey. Um, so, but to, to go back to our conversation, uh, you know, Sarah, you mentioned that there's um, a lag that we see between the development of technologies, the adaptation, mainstream of those technologies, and the policy responses we develop to them. And I think that's one key lag that I, I'll, I'll say a few words about. But I think the second lag I see is, of course, between Europe and the United States in terms of how policy is crafted and even how we're thinking about regulatory uh, frameworks. And I think to that extent, uh, we're also limited in, in the US even if we had the political will, let's say, uh, to be able to implement what are some of the best practices from Europe regardless. So I'll say a couple of words on that as well. Um, so on the first um, gap on the tech policy space, I think um, when we, th we think about the, the fact that Facebook is 15 years old and we still don't have any regulation on social media, I think that tells you a lot about how, how slow the bureaucracy is um, as uh, Jean-Baptiste pointed out, to respond um, to, to the rapid development and implementation and then uh, mainstreaming and um, kind of wider spread of technology. And so by the time we do get regulatory responses, which is, we're st we are starting to get those in Europe anyways, not so, so much in the United States, uh, the new suite of technological tools has already arrived. And so we're constantly in this catch-up game um, that is very, very active, which is a tendency of governments uh, to react versus think much more strategically and proactively. Uh, but I think the danger is that we're going to be stuck in this kind of whack-a-mole for a very long time unless we start looking far more to the future on how uh, emerging technologies in the AI field, but not just in the AI field, um, also in, in quantum computing and its implications for cryptography, um, effective computing, ambient computing, um, all of these uh, uh, um, sets of uh, technologies and their tools that I think most people here in the room know more about than I do. Uh, but I think we need to start thinking much more strategically about how do we craft policies that uh, are basically not dead in the water the second they're implemented. Um, and some of the things, some of the work that we're doing at Brookings in this space is trying to narrow some of that gap. Um, and that goes directly to the point that um, Jean-Baptiste made. Uh, he's also uh, part of this work as our representatives from Estonia and Sweden. Uh, there's a reason for that. Um, uh, to try to bring together a coalition of like-minded democracies at an informal level. Um, f in that includes stakeholders from the industry, uh, from the private sector, from governments across the transatlantic community and from the research community to start to have this conversation about how do we actually craft a policy response that is not as context, that can be adapted to specific contexts, uh, but that is much more broadly about democratic defense 
um, and democratic strategy than it is about the specific uh, context of our own societies. Um, and I think this is kind of the way forward that I see. And so far, I, I have to say that the conversations we've had um, have been incredibly useful and actually find that while um, we often hear a lot of criticism of social media companies and, and other companies that they're not doing enough, um, I actually have found them to be quite receptive to having these conversations um, at different levels. Uh, but the fact that they're there and they're at the table and they're engaging, I think, is, is important. Um, so I think that's one gap that I see a lot of um, uh, of us in the nonprofit world um, and the think tank world, but also in industry and, and, and the public sector trying to engage on new, how do we start to build these informal coalitions um, if we don't have the formal structures. I will say that um, I see some potential future in um, uh, the Paris call and the kind of coalition that is seeking to build, not just around this specific issue, but around a broader set of issues. And I'm curious to see how that develops going forward. Um, but I think the, the other gap that I'll just quickly mention that I already started talking about a little bit is the, is the notion that um, the regulatory frameworks that we're now seeing coming out of Europe with some legislation that's been mentioned, including in France, also in Germany, um, and elsewhere, uh, it, cannot actually be replicated in the US for one basic reason. It's primarily focused on content regulation and controls and content moderation measures, which I think again replicates this whack-a-mole model because the more, uh, con we, even if we could agree on what content we don't want to see in the online space, that's really what we're talking about. Uh, we're not just talking about social media, we're really talking about the whole of, of the digital domain uh, that is, less clear than things like extremism, violence, child pornography, et cetera, that we can all agree should not appear. Um, once we go one level below that to this gray zone of information manipulation or disinformation, however we define the, the term, um, it becomes really, really difficult um, to identify uh, content that we can agree should be taken down. And even if we do somehow agree on what constitutes protected versus illegal content, um, it's, you know, it's just, it's so much easier to put stuff up than it is to take it down. So we're always going to be in, in this kind of constant lag and this constant catch up. And I think on top of that, because of this focus on content moderation and because in the United States we have a much more expansive view of protected speech, like hate speech, for example, is protected in the First Amendment here, um, a lot of the lessons learned from the European context um, just cannot even be discussed in the United States. And so the conversation we're having here is very different, right? It's about antitrust primarily. That's kind of the hot debate right now. It's about setting up an independent regulator perhaps, which is also a conversation happening at the EU level, but in a very different way. So I think a way to get beyond this is to stop focusing on content controls and to really get us to think through what is the regulatory framework that looks at the distribution mechanisms of that content actually look like. And this was also something that came up on the last panel, but what we're talking about here is not, content is basically not the problem, it's an indicator of a problem. The problem is the actual delivery mechanism behind it. And if we start to look under the hood a little bit, um, this question goes far beyond, I think, even uh, algorithmic transparency and uh, data use. It goes into a huge industry of not just online advertising, but kind of these ad mediator companies that match individuals with uh, the ad providers um, in this bidding war that happens like at a millisecond level. And I can guarantee none of us have ever heard of, of all of these companies. And it's um, a huge, huge business. Um, I don't know how large it is. Uh, I think we not, most people don't know. I've seen only like a couple of papers that really outlines the every single step in this content delivery process. One paper that I really recommend to everyone it's called Digital Deceit um, by two uh, researchers. One is at Harvard now, uh, but used to be at, I believe, Facebook before that. Um, that actually names the companies involved. And it's a completely unregulated open environment. And I think we are much more uh, familiar with the platforms because we use them, right? But they're just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this problem. And so I think this is where we need to start focusing. And I have seen some proposals in, uh, from Congress, especially from Senator Warner, that starts to look at, I think, what they call dark patterns and how to identify those. But I think there's so much more there that, we can, be, that can be done to start to um, identify the links in this chain. And, that, and then 
finding solutions for each, how to break each one of these little links, right? And those can come from existing laws around privacy or fraud, for example, or they may warrant um, a new kind of legislative effort. So I will just put that out there um, in terms of the kinds of gaps we see uh, between what Europe is doing and what we continue to do. I think it's going to be very interesting to see where the commission goes, uh, the new commission with the Digital Services Act um, that's supposedly in development. I'm a little bit concerned about how they split up the digital portfolio in the commission, but again, bureaucracy uh, um, is, our, is our enemy here. Um, <coughs> and I think on the other hand, kind of thinking through what is a strategy versus a tactical policy looks like when it comes to addressing future threats from emerging technologies. Thank you. Well, we've had great discipline from our panelists, which means that we have uh, some time for conversation. I'm going to start us off with a little bit of a challenge, which is I see, I'm glad there was a strong NATO document. That's good. But uh, I don't see a strong consensus, at least in this country, on what I would call, or I think you called it, the narrative warfare. Somebody called it narrative warfare. Uh, when we have members of Congress and the president questioning and, and replicating narratives that are coming from the Kremlin, it worries me that we don't have this consensus. So my question is, number one, is the lack of consensus, by definition, one of the big problems? If we can't be clear on naming what happened, doesn't that, in part, suggest that they won in terms of confusion over the narrative? But also, I'm confused why it is that on my cable package I have an RT, or in my car there is Sputnik radio, um, and there's no clear indication of what this is. If I didn't know anything about Russia, I'd be listening, and Sputnik would be normal. We've talked about Facebook and Twitter and various social media platforms that we know or we don't know. But this is on just regular uh, platforms, media, um, as opposed to, or inserts in newspapers. So what are our thoughts on that and whether the lack of consensus is actually a problem? And then please think of what your questions are for these panelists. Anybody want to go first? Can I? Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you, again. I think that's, that's a crucial question. I, I, in my humble opinion. I, don't, I do not think that lack of uh, consensus within our society is, is a problem in of itself. I mean, this is, this is what makes us different. This is, I mean, we're democracies. It's mm -hmm. natural to have a debate, um, and I think we don't want to see that as a, as a problem. Um, I do, however, want to uh, emphasize a point I made earlier I don't think strong enough. I, 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 so I'm going to remake the point. If uh, you hear it for the second time, then you then I did a good job. If you hear it for the first time, I didn't do a good job in my opening remarks. Um, you know, if, if a private company uh, violates my privacy online or elsewhere, spams me with ads, um, you know, bugs me with their products I don't want to, I don't want to know anything about, I think that is solely a problem for the regulators mm -hmm. and the domestic legislation we have in place for regulating that sort of behavior. If another power, as part of their foreign policy, uh, attacks our society with the aim of destabilizing either the international order or our own societies from within, that can be also partly a regulator issue, but it clearly is also a foreign policy problem. Right. No attack derives or comes from the technology. There is a human being behind the technology. And I don't think we can solve this without taking this into consideration. We need to affect not just the way technology works. These ads don't just pop up. These narratives are not just created. This is not a, this is not a, um, a, um, I don't know, a natural phenomenon. This is man-made, and there is a person on the other side making this. So, in my opinion, attribution is obviously important. I mean, there are two ways of deterring. Uh, in in most modern, you know, the theories, deterrence by denial which clearly has not worked, hasn't worked very well, we haven't been able to deny these activities, deterrence by punishment, uh, both to a large extent, but deterrence by punishment almost 100%, dependent upon our ability to uh, attribute the attack. So we, um, at least in my opinion, we, we attach high value to our ability to not just tell the counter story, expose the lies, regulate the marketplace, but also to the uh, aspect of attribution and uh, making this into a foreign policy problem, which it is. Thank you. I, 
agree with everything Jonathan said, and I think one of the crucial things we must do, I mean, coming to the foreign policy narrative and, and, and how, do we, how do we assess the information we get, and it is really go- going back to the basic of education. Mm. We must start extremely early. I was kind of joking about this cartoon, but it's not actually a joke. Uh, and and how, do we, how do we go back to teaching you know, our kids critical thinking, evaluation of information and so on. And this is, of course, a long journey that we need to do. Another challenge that we have uh, with our society or is how our society is used for political means in other countries mm. to show what a liberal, uh, kind of too liberal society would mean if you would go that way. So I was ambassador in Hungary before, and, and this maybe sounds a bit a stupid story, but in one of the big women's magazine, there was like four pages on an article on what feminism has brought to the uh, Swedish men and how terrible that was. I mean, now, okay, excuse my language, but Swedish men were basically not having sex anymore because the women were so strong. There was legislation being passed in our parliament that men were uh, not allowed to stand up when they went to the bathroom. I mean, things like this. And no, and given that the yeah. perception of Sweden is liberal, this yeah. so this is used uh, by forces to say what kind of society you should have, and it's in this sector it's extremely hard to be in front uh, of that. So this is also something we need to think about: how do we how do we tackle that because it's stay, you know used in other countries. Really, Swedish feminism is getting under the skin of. Um perhaps some uh, Russian generals. So that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's very interesting. Any other comments before we open it up? Well, I, I, I don't have much to add. I agree with, the, with Jonathan that the problem is not the lack of consensus. The lack of consensus is, is on the contrary, the symptom of our democratic nature. So we need to value that. Uh, and, and we need to focus not on reaching consensus, which is impossible in our democratic societies. We need to focus on convincing the right people. Uh, knowing that uh, we'll, uh, it will always be impossible to convince maybe 10, 15, 20 percent of the population who believes in conspiracy theories, who watch RT and Sputnik. I think we should just you know, get rid of this ambition uh, uh, of uh, convincing everyone and, and focus on the decision making level uh, if we want to, to get results. Um, and the resilience piece um, that um, both uh, ambassadors have mentioned and, and Jean-Baptiste mentions one of his lessons learned in terms of education. Um, I think this this is much easier said than done, especially, again, going to the United States, scaling this uh, for the U.S. context, meaning implementing um, a na- national level uh, media literacy and digital skills program is basically impossible here because of the decentralized nature of our schooling systems here. Um, they are so highly localized and have and are privatized as well to an extent to which most European systems are not. And I would say even in um, you know wealthy countries that have a, a highly uh, standardized school curriculum where they can make these kinds of changes en masse, it's still incredibly difficult. I was, um, just as a quick anecdote, I was in Germany a few months ago um, for a bit of a, like a little tour around the country on disinformation issues, and I don't usually meet with teachers, uh, but I had the chance to meet with teachers from one of the uh, western uh, provinces um, who were all teaching, you know, uh, one of these uh, gymnasium, which is a, you know, basically preparatory schools for university, so very good students, supposedly, or ideally. Um, and they were all incredibly frustrated, and I felt like I could not offer them anything because they came to me and said, you know, we're being told that um, we're supposed to teach uh, media literacy, but I'm a science teacher, I'm a geography teacher, I don't understand what that means, and we're being asked to design a curriculum for how we do that, that the state would then implement, and they're like, we need the training. We don't know what that means. And, there's, and they said, we don't know what to do because um, our students come to us and they ask questions like, how do I know when a fact is a fact? Right? The, and they're like, we don't know how to answer those questions. And I thought uh, they were really just quite lost. Um, and not having education background myself, I couldn't offer them anything um, except to share their story more widely because I do think often we talk about media literacy, digital skills, uh, that should be a core part of a secondary education, but in practice, it's really difficult to do that. Um, And it really differs by country context. We're in the next session, we're gonna talk about, I'm hoping we're gonna talk briefly about sort of um, 
common threads from the conversation today and what next steps might be. Uh, and this issue of education has come up over and over and over again. Um, and in, in some ways, it's sort of the opposite of, you know, a high-tech response. We're talking about some very basic, not just media literacy, but there are no survey courses in most excellent American universities where they talk about either Soviet history, Russian history, the things that some of us took when we were in school. So all of this seems like it just was born yesterday, um, as opposed to it has a very long tail. Uh, and trying to, I mean, and it feeds into this larger issue of, I, I've been a part of several fields that have collapsed. Uh, <laughs> um, and unfortunately, I think I may be part of, yet again, uh, democracy, human rights advancing around the world, that field collapsing. Um, and it's, it's quite stunning. When those fields collapse, it's not random. There's all sorts of donors and foundations that have pulled away. Uh, in this case, in addition, I think we're seeing some cratering of U.S. global leadership on these issues. And that is having um, a big impact. Um, I want to see if there are general comments out there or questions for the, the yes, please, Ronnie. Thank you. Um, a couple comments uh, for Dr. Polyakova. Um, first, uh, a silver lining to your last comment about the students who uh, didn't have an answer to the question. I'm so happy they posed the question. I mean, the very fact of getting students to think about these questions and pose it is, is one step in a direction. Uh, but um, going back to your earlier comments about the difficulty of um, the uh, legislative and regulatory process not keeping up with emerging technologies, I'm skeptical of trying to predict where technology would go. I think we have a horrible track record as predictors of technology. Um, my question is, wouldn't it make more sense to try to focus on shortening the regulatory cycle and on um, changing the mindset of the regulatory and, and legislative and international co cooperation cycle to, uh, instead of trying to go for the sure thing, to do what is done in startups and businesses, to be wrong early and often, so to try different things, otherwise we will never be there. Um, we must move our societal response to the same time scale as our technological development. Do you see a way of doing that? I'm no, thanks for, thank you so much for your question. Good point on the, on the student questions. Um, um, I, and, 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 and your question about the gap and how wide it is. Um, I completely agree with you that policymakers, um, basically in any country should not be uh, tasked with predicting uh, the evolution of technologies. Uh, we, it's, I mean, technologies are by nature disruptive. I think the reality we face is that our democratic processes and institutions uh, were not established to be able to respond um, as quickly as technologies are developing. And that's why we're seeing some of the tensions we're seeing. And in fact, um, it takes a very long time to come up with any functioning regulatory framework and it takes not just government action though that can be a forcing mechanism it also takes action from civil society um, and it also takes kind of this public awareness campaign um, that we've all been talking about and there are low-hanging fruit i think we are in fact right now in a trial and error period a lot of the things i think are being tried on the policy space in europe um, are problematic um, I mean, uh, Jean-Baptiste mentioned the French law, uh, the German law, the Nets de Gay. It's also problematic as being revised now. So people are trying things, government's trying things, and we're learning what works and what doesn't. So I think right now it's even difficult to say uh, what are the best practices in terms of what actually works, because we don't yet know, because there hasn't been very much time that's passed. And I think there are some low-hanging fruit that are kind of short-term regulatory fixes but I think in the long term, that will save us for a short amount of time. So for example, privacy law, we, how do we think about how that applies in digital domain? Fraud law, right? I'm not an attorney, but these are some things that keep coming up. What is in the actual legal code um, that has been used to address previous issues in the traditional media environment that can be applied to the digital environment as well? So what we actually need is a mapping of the current legal um, uh, mechanisms that we have that the, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? We don't have to build a new government bureaucracy as an independent regulator. And we can use what we have on the books in the meantime until we get to a, a better solution. And one thing that um, I often point to is 
Um, this may not seem like a, a logical uh, analogy, but the entire anti-tobacco campaign in the United States, which, which, which took 60 years to reduce smoking rates in the U.S., uh, was, was, an it was a success. It was incredibly effective by all measures. So if you look at information manipulation, foreign interference in the information environment as a public health threat, right? Um, in, a, in, a, in a similar way in which tobacco and other unhealthy things are a public health threat, then we, there, is, there was a process that developed over time that involved in all of these uh, different interventions from different actors, but it took 60 years, right? Um, but So that's just my point of saying it has to be a mixture of all of these things, the short-term fixes, plus broader strategic thinking um, on how do we actually develop resilience in the long term, um, and how do we actually try to revise some of our democratic processes and institutions to be uh, more responsive um, in a way they're not set up to do. I mean, this is actually my deep concern, um, is that our institutions are non-digital, right? They're not, they weren't established in the 21st century. Um, and so we need to think about how can they be more responsive? Uh, because until we do that, I think, we, I just, foresee a lot of problems <laughs> coming up um, as we go, as we progress in, in the era of artificial intelligence and related tech. When I was at USAID, we ran a grand challenge for development around this issue of how do you get people inside government who oftentimes are really in a 19th century mode, listening and responding to citizens uh, who are in a 21st century mode, and it's incredibly difficult to do. Um, while you're talking about legislation, let's also mention beneficial ownership. While it wouldn't be a tech response, it is, it's a larger response. We've got several cards and we've got a short period of time and I also have two quick questions. So let's do a lightning round with Daryl first. Just, walk uh, away just quickly way. along the lines that were just spoken about, I, I'm just wondering if there's more to be learned from history um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. I mean, I'm reading more and more about the incredible parallels to the invention of the printing press and the struggles society had following, you know, huge changes in power structures and how information was shared and actually how much disinformation there was propagated following the, the printing press. I'm wondering if anybody's succeeded in getting an Interpol red notice out on a major hacker. And uh, if so, was that person ever in interdicted? Uh, if not, is that a direction we could go in sooner rather than later? So I'm wondering about why focus so much on narrative. Add two quick things to the agenda, and then we're going to go down the, the row. A question for you coming out of Hungary. We didn't talk about it today, but there's been a lot of discussion about the role of civil society. Around the world, there's an epidemic of closing space around civil society, where laws, uh, dozens of laws in, in countries uh, have been passed to make it more difficult for civil society to thrive, and Hungary uh, is one of many. Um, obviously, Russia has done this as well. Does that play a role here uh, in any of the responses? People keep talking about the need for resilient and responsive civil society, and I worry about that. And finally, just so I understand, there is this alliance of democracies, a policy dialogue. One of the questions we're going to be talking about in the next session is whether or not there's needed another policy slash tech dialogue, or, or is, it, is it okay? Do you guys have it, or is there a need for more? Um, we have a sp couple specific ideas of, of how. So we have history, the role of the printing press. I have a personal concern over red notices and the use of Interpol by many countries uh, that aren't necessarily the most legal uh, in nature. Um, Kathleen's very smart questions, I think, that go to Alina. Uh, and then this issue of closing space and then um, policy dialogues. Thank you. I, I'll take maybe two questions. Uh, the, the first on, um, on history, uh, I, I think you're right, and uh, we should uh, focus more on, um, on history, not only the printed press, but then uh, that was like the first revolution, but then the second was the mass media. And, and the third is internet and, and the social media and, and the digital uh, platforms. But we need to uh, think also in terms of is it a difference of degree 
or is it a difference of nature what we see today compared to these previous uh, steps and i think the speed makes it so different that even though it looks a degree in practice it's like nature and you you have this example of uh, operation infection by the uh, KGB, you know, uh, when they planted uh, the fake story that the uh, AIDS virus was a fabrication of the CIA, they, they did it in 1983 in an Indian newspaper and it took four years until 97, until uh, 87. It took four years for the story to reach a global audience. Same thing today, it takes a couple of hours to reach millions of people. So is it a difference of degree or nature? So look, looking at history, yes, but there are significant differences as well in terms of speed um, and therefore in terms of responses. And uh, second, on the diplomatic format, do we need, do we need more? Um, obviously, we have many formats already, uh, but if you take the EU, um, why, why I, I said earlier that none of the uh, current formats are satisfactory because uh, in the EU you have Hungary, for example, or, or you have states like uh, uh, Italy uh, or Greece uh, that, that, does not, that don't see Russia like, like, like the Baltic states, for example. Uh, so the diversity of the EU makes it uh, a difficulty. NATO, same thing, you have Turkey in NATO. And Turkey is very much interested in what's happening in Riga at the moment at the Stratcom Center, and they want to be part of it. And, and, and in Riga, they are quite reluctant, but they don't have the legal means to say no, because Turkey is part of NATO. Uh, then you have the G7. So I was with, uh, with Alina a couple of weeks ago in Ottawa for a uh, G7 uh, uh, a meeting. And the problem of, of the G7 format is that you have two states, Italy and Japan, that are less interested uh, in, in the subject uh, uh, because they think that it's not really a grave uh, preoccupation uh, for different reasons, uh, Italy and, and, and Japan. Uh, so you have all, all these formats. Uh, they are not satisfactory. Uh, and so we need to create a, a new one uh, that is based on like-minded democratic states uh, and that is different. Thank you. Um, the issue in history, I think, is for our, when it comes to us, it's uh, what I said earlier, we are reverting back to the methods and uh, the structures we had before that we didn't think we would need anymore. Uh, so we are using the same kind of thinking about influence operations and so on, but of course having to adapt uh, how we do it uh, to, to modern technology and like you said, speed. Uh, I think that's really, uh, but, but luckily it's not that long ago, so big parts of the Swedish population still have this kind of thinking. Mm. Uh, it's it's it, at least the parent, parent generation and then of course we have to get the younger generation to to, to realize it back. When it comes to um, civil society and shrinking space, uh, I really, this is, of, of course, is extremely worrying uh, when, when uh, NGOs become foreign agents or yeah. classified as foreign agents and so on. And if you have a weak, a weak civil society, of course, there will be must, must, much less criticism mm -hmm. on the information space because mm -hmm. it's people are not engaged or it's not mm -hmm. possible to be engaged in the same way, etc. So I, I think this is one of the most serious challenges to us today, that people feel that they, it's dangerous to be part of interest organizations, uh, no matter what they are. So uh, I, I find it so hard to accept or understand that this is actually going on within the European Union. Mm. There's a oh, big stop so sign up there, <laughs> and I, I, I need to run soon, so I'll, I'll be very brief. I think uh, historical parallels are striking, um, not only with regards to what's going on in, in the information uh, sphere, but also with regards to the, uh, the way our economies function. Um, people have uh, obviously noticed geopolitical uh, resemblances and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think this, this just points to the fact that the, the, the stuff that we've been discussing here um, matters a lot. Uh, we have to wake up. Mm. We have to recognize what the danger is. Mm. Uh, we have to mobilize everything that we have. Uh, this is not a think tank issue or a university mm -hmm. issue or a minister of defense or foreign affairs issue. Th this, 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 is a, this goes to the core of our, uh, the, the way we function as societies. Two uh, key words I want to emphasize, institutions, and I use this term in the widest possible meaning, the institution of the free media, including uh, 
that are important and that we need to strengthen also international institutions. Obviously, I would like to have a like-minded group of nations um, uh, organization until we get there. Strengthening NATO, strengthening the European Union is obviously of paramount importance. And secondly, and I think Karim mentioned this earlier, education uh, can't do without it and should not be surprised. I mean, if you leave behind a segment of your society, leave them behind at an early age, then don't be surprised when 10, 15, 20 years later, you all of a sudden find out that you have a bunch of people who believe in the flat earth uh, mm. theory. I mean, this is what happens. Mm. So education is key. Um, just very quickly, just on Kathleen's question, um, um, I think this question of anonymity online is really what you're getting at, um, whether or not the whole idea of having completely anonymous, unverifiable entities functioning in the online environment um, is even tenable anymore. And I think that is a part of the conversation. I don't think it's a real part of the conversation yet, but I think it's becoming very clear to me that this age of 1990s, you know, all open, um, anonymous internet um, is just no longer viable, um, given the kinds of opportunities it provides for manipulation. Um, so I think those are great ideas, but I think unfortunately not really at the top of the policy agenda right now. Please join me in thanking our terrific panelists, and we're gonna we're gonna roll in to I think quite rapidly to the closing session, where I'm gonna pull forward some ideas and themes that we might think about. Um, Ambassador Herbst is gonna make some comments, and then we have delicious cookies and pastries and coffee uh, for us to enjoy. So I'm between you and something sweet, <laughs> which is never a great place to be, but maybe better than between you and a cocktail. But thank you so much. Um, OK. So um, my comments are in sort of three baskets. Um, the first basket has to do, this is in the order of on the to-do list. Uh, the first basket is this issue of dialogue and closing the chasm, as somebody, I think it was you, Ed, who described between the tech and policy folks. Um, there's a lot that needs to happen in terms of that dialogue. I think one area that we might be looking at is the multiple centers of excellence that have popped up and how, whether or not they are truly as excellent as they say they are. Uh, there are lots of them in different places and that seems like a natural place to bring together technologists and the policy community, sort of a Euro-Atlantic policy slash tech dialogue. Um, there were some comments made earlier in the day um, that there hadn't been any kind of real planning for what happened in the United States in 2016, which I find not only alarming, but I think it's worth thinking about whether or not we could do something different around planning. Uh, and it, it's somewhat akin to what Krishnan was talking about in terms of a test bed. Uh, the point is, how do you generate collective action on these issues? Uh, what does that look like? Um, I was surprised by how much non-tech responses were mentioned as opposed to tech responses. I think the main tech response has to do with transparency in platforms, uh, in tracing information, um, and, and moving towards the development of platforms that are much more transparent versus revenue generating or engagement generating. Um, and I don't know how we do that or what that would look like, but that's a very interesting idea. Uh, in addition to stress testing the infrastructure for uh, attacks. But, so let me just close on the, on the non-tech responses that are needed, which I would put under the broad category of back to the future. Um, I think education, both in terms of uh, literacy, public awareness, K through eight was mentioned, but sort of more general public awareness, both in terms of the fact that a lot of this is not totally new. The method or the platform is new, but the act of measures um, has a long, decades long um, record in making sure that, um, including members of Congress, understand that this isn't um, 
quote, fake news, close quote, that this is all part of a larger issue. Um, the There's a lot of focus on civil society, and I worry that there's a lot of pressure on civil society that, you know, civil society will solve these problems when anybody who's worked in a nonprofit knows there are challenges to raising revenue to be able to do work in this space, not to mention the closing space issues. Um, so it's a it's a question of resource uh, and and how we how we deal with that. Um, I think if we were to do nothing more, nothing less than uh, convening on this issue of public education on these issues, I think that would be worthwhile. Um, and I would like uh, for colleagues to think about whether or not a very specific tech slash policy Euro Atlantic conversation uh, in these NATO. Uh, centers of excellence uh, and the hybrid center of excellence uh, in Helsinki would be worthwhile. So I will stop there. Okay. Um, thank you all for being here as we close right now. Um, thank you for Sarah. This is really her brainchild, and I think it was a wonderful event. And thank you to Heinz College and Carnegie Mellon University. Bringing in academics on this very, very important field is something long overdue, and Sarah has done that in, in a very, very um, thorough way. That's, that's important. Uh, I think that the conversation today, and I apologize for missing parts of it, though there is this thing called the Normandy Summit going on uh, today, uh, I think this is ripe for further exploration. I think there should be additional sessions, as Sarah already um, outlined, and I hope we'll be able to maintain this partnership. I would just like to add um, one substantive comment to this following up on, on, on Sarah's remarks. Uh, this is, as a political issue, a, an, an old problem or a problem with a long lineage. And it's a, an issue which, in fact, the Russians are really good at. If you studied the Soviet Union and you studied Marxist-Leninism, you know they developed the concepts of both propaganda and agitation. One was for the masses, the other was for the educated classes. And so the whole issue of how to persuade your enemies or your, your adversaries' publics to move in your direction is one they've got uh, many, many decades of experience with. What's new is the technology and the way they go about pursuing this objective. So obviously, Social media have, have become the main conduit for, for, this, for this plan, for this, this uh, effort. And before, they used print media, they used movies, they used radio, and they used intellectual conferences. Those things are still part of the game, but they're actually secondary today. And what this means is that before, you could combat this problem principally with a combination of some government work, and especially government work which pulled in um, intellectuals. But today, it's, it's, a, it's a much broader problem, requiring a much broader effort. And what we're finding, what we're finding is our still, um, the inability we still have to manage these social media is an impediment to getting a grasp on this problem. Uh, and uh, I don't have a brilliant idea for addressing that. Um, I'm not certain. There probably is one out there, and we'll have to find it. But th this is something that has to be addressed within the broader context of how we manage social media. Because one thing we don't want to do is mess with our long-established freedoms in an effort to deal with this very specific problem. Anyway, Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.